and a welcome to Haystack Live. And uh, I think without further ado, I'm going to help hand over now to uh, Agenia for her talk, um, a little bit more about her today. Uh, she's a data advocate at T Taloka. Uh, she advocates for democratizing data quality, uh, quality data ownership. And she's working on developing the Taloka global community. Um, and she's also organizing data-driven AI meetups. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you, um, Evgenia, and uh, please, off you go. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you. So let me share and let me check that everything is working right. Please tell me if anything seems uh, incorrect to you. You can see. Yes? Okay. Yeah, we I can see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let me start then. Uh, so today I hope we will have a very relaxed conversation slash session from me about data labeling for search relevance evaluation. And since Charlie introduced me, I won't be repeating much. Uh, so that's what are we gonna talk about today. I will try to give a full outline, a full example of a pipeline, how you can evaluate search relevance with a human in the loop and uh, offline metrics. So let's dive in without like a further ado, as Charlie mentioned. So firstly, uh, let's face the problem. <laughs> what are we talking about today? So as we know, we have a lot of information retrieval systems now in use. And of course they require evaluation and they are working with a huge amounts of data. So it's like a hard task. It's a challenge to make them high quality. In general, information retrieval systems can be in various domains, but today I would like to focus mostly on the search engines uh, working in general. Uh, on the floor of the domains, but of course this topic is also applied to some more specific things like retrieval systems, like in ecom, recommendation systems, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these systems, they're usually performing the ranking of the documents, which they're returning to some like. Uh, information they need to retrieve to some query and this ranking usually is performed by some automation algorithms like machine learning and of course uh, the corpuses which it's working with are very very large so the evaluation is needed and it needs to be fast uh, with these large corpora it might be a problem so one of the solutions to make it pretty feasible uh, is to use human in the loop, which means to combine the forces of the machinery and uh, of the manual help. I will try to do uh, today a full overview of the pipeline that you actually can use uh, for evaluating your information retrieval slash search engine system uh, fully. Uh, with the help of the human in the loop. So at the end of the talk, I really hope that you will have like a, something not to only think about, but actually go take and apply to your system. Uh, whole over stages of this pipeline, I will break down to like little pieces and explain it piece by piece. Uh, so let's start from the very beginning, from the ranking. So if we're talking about the search quality evaluation, uh, we need to understand what is quality and how to evaluate it. So just imagine we have like some search engine and we're having like a question to ask it, some query and it returns some documents. And of course, the quality of the returned ranking of the documents might be based on the several characteristics, which can be relevance, freshness, or even like some either other things based on the human biases, because we know, for example, like the position bias existing in the nature. So a lot of things are actually making up uh, to the quality of the result in the quality evaluation. But we need to start somewhere. And of course, there are like different metrics designed for it. I will uh, show you like one of them, a little bit talk about others. But in general, like, of course, the metrics that you are want to evaluate, the quality, how you want to evaluate your system based on your task, on your domain and on your own preferences. So I will start uh, as an example. I will use the most uh, like commonly used and most commonly known metrics uh, for ranking in the search relevance systems, which is normalized discounted cumulative gain. 
uh, it doesn't mean that it's like the state of the art and that's something that you should take only it and not consider others, but that's a good start. Um, of course, at the end, I will provide a little bit sources about other metrics and we can discuss what can be better for you in the, some certain situations. Uh, so NDCG, as it for short, uh, works in a way that it considers the since like, you know, how humans approach usually the uh, retrieval documents, uh, like when they're searching and they see the result, they're usually searching for something in the higher positions. So the logic is simple. The higher the position of the relevant document is, the better our system performs. So here you can see that like system B is in general better because ideally, uh, the document number two with the most relevance should be at the beginning and system B exactly puts it there. Uh, and DCG is a normalized version of a DCG. Uh, it's made uh, normalized to make easy to compare different results uh, with the different algorithms applied for ranking. Uh, so the comparison might be fair. What might be the problems with this matrix, which you always need to hold in mind and recheck that it's uh, like if you are using it on a very large uh, amount of items, which is usually is the case with the information retrieval systems, because the amount of relevant items are usually huge, that uh, rank is usually uh, when the rank of the, the position of the document goes to infinity, uh, the matrix is usually um, converging to one. But there are some workarounds that you can use. You can, for example, use for evaluation the NDCGK, like evaluating only top K results, which is very well and goes into the line with the position bias which humans are experiencing, or use like some and other polynomial physics uh, discounting functions. Uh, you can look it up at the paper that I provided on this slide. And yeah, of course, uh, all of these choices should be in like in agreements with the data set size that you want to evaluate. So we have like a function. We decided, okay, let's, for example, evaluate our system on NDCG because it's pretty feasible and it works good. So now we know that we want to have our NDCG. We want to check our ranking algorithm. Uh, our machine learning model, for example, which we're training provides us some ranking, how to understand that it, this ranking is good. Uh, as we know, in NDCG, uh, the comparison is goes with some ideal ranking. So we need to get this ideal ranking from somewhere. <laughs> And from where it to gets, like maybe we should uh, somehow manually place the documents ourselves. That's where human in the loop starts coming. So there is a way to obtain an ideal ranking. But uh, of course, we can't rank everything because our like system of the documents that we're having, it's like huge, it's enormous. So we need some sampling. And of course, a sampling should be big enough to cover the general characteristics of a data set that you're owning, but it shouldn't be that big that it's like unable to uh, evaluate this sampling. It's just unfeasible. So let's see what are the algorithms of sampling. Uh, and what does it mean in general sampling? So imagine uh, you have some certain amount of queries that you want to cover and check how good is the answers on them. Uh, so sampling, it means sampling of the queries which your information retrieval system works with. And here is the question like uh, which ones to use because like queries there, that's an infinite domain. Human can ask everything to the information retrieval system, but we have some history so we know what is being asked. And uh, there are several options how to approach this problem. For example, you can use the most popular queries. Okay, like since it's most popular, it's mostly asked. Uh, so if uh, the person comes to our system and wants to understand how much he's satisfied with the quality of it um, and stay or go away, uh, we are expecting that the most popular queries is most important to address correctly. On the other hand, it's not that much of them. And... Uh, Selecting only them, usually they're already pretty much well tuned because like we're always putting attention on them and maybe some feedback, loop, feedback loops are already telling us that there are some mistakes in them. We can try to use especially unique queries. So like go on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, but the problem here that, yeah, um, that will 
go to the human satisfaction because like users will be expecting to find an answer to their specific query and if they won't find it in your information retrieval system and they will be dissatisfied they may stop being loyal to your system and just never use it again but on the other hand the amount of unique queries is enormous it's like the huge tales of this distribution of popularity of queries so also doesn't seem like a right choice maybe we need to take something in the middle and uh, there are like some simple ideas how you can sample you can just take uh, with some probability uh, every query and uh, like classic coin problem heads tails take not take and then you will have some some like amount of queries that you can evaluate but firstly it's not controllable by size and secondly it's not controllable by popularity you don't understand what you are sampling you just have some amount of objects but uh, will it represent the quality of the system you don't know there are more sophisticated methods like reservoir sampling which you can check out in the research literature where you can limit the size of the uh, sample but still uh, the popularity or not popularity of queries it's not considered and uh, that's very important because you need to understand what is the balance uh, in your query distribution in your sample and here it's our ours a uh, team which works uh, like uh, with uh, search relevance evaluation ours a local recommendation which we usually do ourselves when we are checking the search quality it's to sample queries with a stratified sampling. That's a very nice approach in the means that firstly, it uh, covers the problem of selecting the certain amount of queries which are popular, certain amount of queries which are unique and something in between. Uh, and it works on this simple idea that you uh, take the whole amount of queries which you have and their popularity, so the amount of times they're being asked, you divide them in buckets and then you divide these buckets based on the idea that in each bucket the amount of times this query um, have been presented in sum uh, it should be pretty much equal in between buckets and then from each bucket you sort of uh, sample some certain limited amount of queries and in the end you have a nice distribution which reflects in general uh, the document domain of your system so okay we have a sampling idea we have a sampling algorithm how much do we need to sample once uh yeah of course it might depend on your like budgets problems ideas and etc but also a general recommendation um it's to sample three baskets of them because usually when we are working with uh, like algorithms of ranking we are addressing a several problems which is firstly of course training on this ranking algorithm and for that you need training test validation the classical machine learning like paradigmas that you always have to uh, have a three specific sets for that also it's very nice to sample um, a basket of queries to check kpis of your service because you are always working for a greater future so you need to monitor how healthy it is how good it is is it hitting like is it growing in the quality and etc so that is for kpi and yeah of course uh, there are also when we're talking about like testing the quality uh, usually people like when i'm talking on the conferences or something and i'm asking okay guys how do you test that your like some changes in your service and your search relevance engine that they are feasible that they're high quality and people say a b testing of course i mean so the same you actually can do with offline metrics not online metrics as a b testing you can do a b testing offline with uh, sampling these baskets of the buckets and then showing them to a crowd and that's what exactly I want to talk about so the time the most I would say important part for me as a data advocate as a data advocate from a crowdsourcing company is to explain that you can use crowdsourcing human in the loop uh, in this offline metrics uh, making pretty well um, results of the evaluation because the conception is the following uh, when you're testing your metrics online when you're doing a, a b testing you can for face the user dissatisfaction because for example you did something incorrect and in a b testing it's tested on the real end users so they're seeing some mistakes and they're just might 
live. Uh, with offline testing, you don't have such a problem. The second problem is like with online testing, uh, it takes some time. It takes some time because to experiment to end, you sometimes need weeks uh, and sometimes some mistake happens in the middle and you have to start it from the beginning. So uh, when you need to do it faster, offline evaluation is actually at hand. Um, also, what is nice about a flying evaluation with a crowd is that this signal is not artificial, so it's not about overfitting, it's literally the end users of your system uh, giving their judgments, which are not biased towards some parts of your machinery, uh, which are really close to how people are reacting to your service and to the ranking in the end which is provided to them. So in general, how you can create this pipeline with the crowdsourcing offline evaluation and online evaluation, of course, you also should keep it because A-B testing is still a very nice thing. Uh, so you're training your algorithm on the human gathered data, which I will be talking how to do it uh, in the following, uh, with these samples that we talked about already. Then we're doing some certain versions where some certain versions of algorithm of survey, service, like different rankings, we are evaluating them offline, then we're selecting the best versions online, evaluating them for, say, 24 hours or so. Uh, usually it's enough. Uh, then we're, of course, uh, putting it to production and we're performing sanity checks, uh, KPI evaluation on the also third basket that we already sampled. How to do it with a human evaluation? Okay, so here comes the crowdsourcing part. And the crowdsourcing, uh, if somebody doesn't know, is the it's a, such a way to give some assignments, some very simple assignments broke, broken down to single items uh, for evaluation to a human crowd all over the world for like um, in a very simple manner. And it's very scalable because the amount of crowd on the crowd platforms and crowd services is like thousands hundreds of thousands of people which can take up your assignments so you're generating an assignment to them and you're asking them okay complete it for like some uh, certain amount of uh, money which is usually pretty much um, very little so uh, let's see there are like different ways how you can uh, pose an assignment to them uh, you can just give them like a search query and you can give them a list of like documents retrieved in a certain way. And you say, okay, is this ranking good? Or you can uh, give them and say how this result is relevant to this query market from like one to five. This is uh, also a way, but the problem is that here a lot of biases stepping in, the human biases, and the uh, results are usually not as good as asking the simple thing uh, for a general human not trained specifically for a task is to just to try to say, what do you like more, the left or the right result? What do you think? How it matches it? Better or worse? So it's called a specific term. It's side-by-side -side tasks evaluation. So in general, these are the best options for using for evaluating the relevancy of the result to the query. Here you can see the example. So how to check that the results which the human crowd will provide will be high quality? Because of course, when it comes to humans, which are not employed with you, which are not signing an NDA contract, which are not working on your machinery and your algorithms, uh, you are suspecting that the results might be bad or like it might be frauded. And in the end, you're like, no, I'm not trusting them. I don't want to use it in my evaluation cycle, even if it's scalable. Uh, but yeah, there are like some certain mechanisms in crowdsourcing, which are like already existing there for some time. For example, you are... Um, testing them on some hidden tasks, which are called golden or pre-annotated tasks, and you're assigning them some skills. So you know that these performance with this uh, type of assignments, they're high quality, and they can uh, work on them with a certain like close to perfect uh, amount of quality, and you can use them without being afraid of it. So let's say we did our Part. we 
understood what metrics we are evaluating, we subsampled our queries, and with crowdsourcing, we obtained some results. So uh, we obtained the results in the means that the crowdsourcing seen that queries, and they seen some retrieved documents that we are usually providing uh, gathered side by side, and they did an evaluation in the means that, yeah, these documents use this query much better than that one. And so we have a lot of this raw data and uh, we need to understand, okay, this is better than that, but how to uh, like have now this ideal ranking that we should compare our metrics to, how from this huge amount of raw data get this answer, which will uh, give us, okay, our accuracy, our NDCG is like 95% perfect and we need to tune this 5%. And here comes the answer aggregation which is with side-by-side -side topics works like this. Uh, so usually when you're like aggregating some results in the classification tasks, for example, or like some other tasks, you know that there are like some ground truth there. So this is like, if we have a picture of a cat, this is a cat. But uh, when we're talking about the side-by-side -side tasks with an aggregation, there is like some certain difficulty uh, with com coming up with a, such a like simple aggregation of the results uh, that this is very subjective. So we can't assume that there is like a ground truth somewhere that the user like the one user like the document retrieved, which was placed on the left. Some user liked more document, which retrieved, uh, which was placed on the right. And uh, maybe in some sense, they are both true because like they have different preferences of like different desires. So here we can't use some traditional models, which are like using some Latin assumptions, like expectation maximization algorithm or something simple like this. No, we have to uh, formalize this task and solve it with a little bit more complicated mathematical model. So let's formalize, what do we have? We have these answers, like I like this document retrieved to my query and I like this document retrieved to my query. So we have items, which are like the results of the query. And uh, we have a pairwise comparisons done by worker K uh, between two documents, I and J, and this worker said that he thinks that I is better than J. And now we need to obtain a ranking of all, all of these documents to that query. And this ranking exactly will be the ideal one, which we will use to measure the quality of our service for each query. And in the end, we can have the overall rank of our system and see like the pitfalls and maybe like focus on some things that we need to improve. And we have like a very classical model, which exists around, around, oof, since 50s. I mean, uh, good classical things, which are always working, uh, but of course they're updated, but still the general idea is still perfectly suiting for the problem. So this Bradley Terry model, uh, and it works in general like this. So just imagine that every item, so every document to our search query has some score. Uh, you can call it like maybe a rank in the means that the higher the score is, uh, the higher this uh, document should be placed. And um, here we uh, have the probability. Um, uh, so in general, we know that when users ranked uh, like left or right, what do they like more? Uh, they expressed uh, their preference. So uh, in general, when we are aggreg aggregating all of this, we want to be the most preferred by the general like uh, amount of users ranking our queries, the most preferred document be on the top. So having these rankings, which were provided by users, uh, I mean, uh, ranking sales is a little bit confusing. I would say having this uh, assignments, having these pairs uh, being done, being evaluated by the users, uh, we know with the some probability that this item is liked more because for example, this user said that. So uh, then with some algorithm like, uh, I don't know, gradient descent, we can just solve an optimization problem and assign each document a score, uh, which shows the general preferability among the others. And then taking this score, we can rank them in the 
desired fashion, and that would be our ideal ranking. The problem is this model is very old and it, it's very naive. So it thinks that all performers are equally good and truthful, which is never the case in the crowdsourcing, sadly. So there were like a very nice and still working adjustment, which I am very recommending to using, which is noisy Bradley Terry. This model is an update of the previous model, which adds uh, two certain characteristics of a human being uh, ranking your data, which is reliability. So did the user read the assignment or not? Because maybe it's just a robot who is clicking on the left all the time and wants to uh, make you bankrupt and your system not succeed. And the bias. Uh, bias is the thing what usually user prefers more, like the left or the right document. We're certainly very biased. I think I told the term bias today so many times, just in general, reminding that the humans are very biased <laughs> creatures. So here you can see the likelihood model uh, considering these two features of a user, reliability and the bias, and also, of course, considering the scores of the documents. And the idea is the same. We're taking gradient descent and we're just like... Uh, using our scores from the um, assignment of the crowdsourcing, we're just uh, making it the most likable. So likelihood, we are maximizing li the likelihood and uh, we're, uh, by maximizing the likelihood, we're coming up with the parameters uh, of this function, which is like, uh, not the parameters, I'm sorry, with the variables of this function, which are reliability, bias, and desired scores. And here you can see how it works. For example, we have two users, um, so one is definitely, okay, not definitely, but with a, some consideration is a robot because he always selects the left one object, the left document and user number one seems much more reliable because he has like some choices and they're like aligning together in some certain rank. And this is the result of the model. So we're, we're having ranking and we're also knowing how good, uh, how good our performance are. And, uh, it sounds like a lot of mathematical jibber jabber. So like, hey guys, uh, I am telling you today how to make the evaluation of the model. So now you do math and do this and do that and uh, understand everything and the information is overloading. But in general, for example, for uh, aggregation techniques, uh, we have a crowd kit, which is uh, very similar to scikit-learn for somebody who knows in the interface, which just does the aggregation for any kind of crowdsourcing data uh, automatically with uh, calling one interface, one function. And it also includes Bradley Terry or noisy Bradley Terry. So if you are at that step when you're already having everything except aggregation, uh, I encourage you to use it. It's open source. Uh, so just apply this and you will have your rankings out of the pairwise comparisons without you know, struggling with implementing these mathematical models. And uh, now uh, we have basically everything except like one question, which is always asked by me, uh, by usually business people, because it's uh, very related to the money. Uh, it's very related to the amount of the data that we should evaluate. And it also, of course, concerns uh, engineers because uh, like how much, where is, when it comes to sampling, people are very uh, concerned uh, where is that golden value, which will provide the most close to the truth uh, result and here like we talked already about the sampling of the queries so we know that from all of our uh, engine we selected some queries which users ask but now for each query we need to do this evaluation with crowdsourcing with these pairwise comparisons and uh, in these pairwise comparisons documents which our algorithm returns as relevant are presented in the pairwise comparison so how much of them we should take to make it reliable so how many pairs we should select? Uh, let's say we said, okay, I am taking this query and I'm taking with my algorithm top 10 elements, which my algorithm return. Uh, but uh, now should I take uh, all of them n squared? Should I like literally evaluate 100 uh, 
pairwise comparisons for one query, oh my God, then I will never finish the task and I will get uh, super dissatisfied. And yeah, I understand that uh, taking and square all of the comparisons of the documents between each other, it's a little bit an overkill. And maybe in the perfect system, that would be amazing, but sadly we can afford it. Uh, so there is a, a one general idea how to reduce this amount of pairs. Um, and it's actually based on a very simple thing as a sorting. As we know that the general sorting algorithms uh, work uh, good sorting algorithm. There are sorting algorithms which, which work with n squared, but we're not talking about them. Uh, so the good sorting algorithm is working with n log n. And we are here kind of doing the task, which is also sorting. We're trying to find uh, some certain sequence which are sorted from the most relevant to the least relevant. And here we can't take exactly n log n uh, because like if we're using n log n, um, it's uh, not enough because uh, uh, n log n is used when the uh, comparisons are transitive. So we know that the object A is better than object B and the object B is ob better than object C, then object A is better than object C. Of course, in real life, it's nothing like this because people are prefer different things. They are very, uh, even I one day prefer this over that and the next day I'm completely changing my opinion. But we need to settle somewhere. There should be some point. Uh, so we can just take a Bradley-Cherry probabilistic transitivity. So the model that I was talking before about, uh, we can just think that, OK, we are not sure that this is better than that. But with some probability, this document is the best. So with this some probability, we can take a sum assumption of the transitivity and use it as a basis. And that would be good enough. So uh, to obtain that, we're just uh, understanding that, OK, uh, n log n is too less, n squared is too much. So there should be some constant in between, which uh, will make the result most probably ordered rightfully. And the most probably, the top document will be the most relevant for user. And the second one will be like least relevant, but still relevant. So it will be the nice ranking, which we desire with some probability. And the higher the probability will be, the more we will sample of these pairs. So this is a hyperparameter. Of course, it also depends on your uh, document choices, on your domain choices, on your system choices. Uh, and it's very individual, but usually it's less than 12. So here you don't have to like spend so much time and money and everything on evaluation. You can just stay in some simple like borders. So here, finally, we're coming to an end. So what did we do? We selected a matrix. We sampled our queries to evaluate how good the retrieved by our, by our ranking algorithm the documents are. Uh, we selected for each query some amount of the top documents that we're interested to check how good they are, how they're relevant they are. We sampled pairs of these documents to check, like to make a ranking in the end. We evaluated them with crowdsourcing. We aggregated them. So we have our ideal ranking for each query. We uh, have ideal ranking. By this ideal ranking and the ranking of our system, at the end, we can compare them and see how our, our the ranking of the system is far from ideal. So we computed our metrics. And now we can see how is the current quality. And this current quality will reflect how good the system is, what are the pitfalls, what we should correct maybe we should look at our unique queries or maybe we should like in this particular domain check something or maybe we should rearrange uh, our retrain our algorithm or like on some specific uh, uh, users uh, apply another algorithm so in general we finished our loop and then we can start once again because our system should be monitored consequently uh, and very frequently because Word is changing, context is changing. So freshness, for example, of the documents retrieved and relevance of the document retrieved changes every day. And uh, users are getting dissatisfied with the results that they were satisfied before. 
So coming into the conclusion, uh, that's exactly what do we have, that what I discussed, that uh, we need to have all of these parts, which I really hope I explained. And if there are any questions, I would be very happy to address them. Uh, so we have our pipeline, which we can use. And uh, with each service state, we can evaluate it, compare it to ideal and fix it. And a little bit of the some takeaways about the crowdsourcing, because I think it's the most uh, new term for the crowd here. Uh, so what about crowdsourcing um, in relation to a lot of ML problems? It's actually, uh, I, am I am advocating personally for data-centric approach because it's the approach uh, which people started looking at more precisely last years. Um, we have a lot of amazing machine learning models and they're working very good. But the problem is that machine learning model is also based on the data quality. And the data quality, uh, it's a very big problematic thing because uh, not enough of quality data is generated and stored. And most, <laughs> most uh, like important thing, it's not uh, like given to people. You can't easily get it. It's uh, That's why I'm talking about the democratization of the high quality data. It's not so many and so many domains uh, available high quality data sets that you can train on. Uh, and that's exactly why crowdsourcing can be a good solution because it allows to uh, have high quality data, which will help to improve your machine learning algorithms in general. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much a nice one because of course it's not as fast as say synthetic data generation, but uh, on the other hand, it's much more um, easy to work with crowdsourcing when you need to have some specific data generated at some specific domains, which can be with a high quality synthetically generated or crawled. And uh, of course, there is, as everywhere in the life, there is a trade-off. Here is a trade-off between accuracy and data set size. So I was talking a lot today about sampling and choosing like a lot of hyperparameters. So yeah, of course, the more data you give them, the higher the quality will be, but there is somewhere the sensible threshold so, the, so which you can use and it will be pretty much satisf satisfactory for your um, overall system evaluation. And uh, of course, especially considering the search um, uh, relevance problem and the search systems, of course, crowdsourcing is not the only solution. Manage crowd, which I'm manage crowd is talking about experts. Like usually people, when they're talking about manual labeling, to their mind comes some groups of experts, which they're higher and they're specifically manually labeling the data, knowing very well about the domain and providing their knowledge. This is not excluding each other. You can combine them. And in the end, with an expert manual labeling and with crowdsourcing labeling together, you can perceive that scale and the quality at the same time. So I guess this was uh, most of the takeaways that I wanted to give about the crowdsourcing. And I provided a little bit of useful resources to maybe read around uh, of the, each part of the pipeline. And maybe Charlie will distribute them if it's possible, because I think there was so many information uh, that it's not so easy to remember uh, at the beginning. And a lot of people perceive much better information from reading than from talking. So there are papers about different parts of the pipeline. Anyways, I will be very happy to talk about each part of the pipeline. I will be ha very happy to answer some questions. I can understand that from the beginning it might be not so clear because it's a, a lot of information a lot of new terms a lot of everything especially with crowdsourcing it's also a science and you need to understand how to apply the crowd correctly uh, but i think in the end it's a very much working pipeline which is already applied uh, by many companies for many years for a search evaluation. So uh, understanding and applying it makes a lot of sense to your uh, information retrieval systems. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Evgenia. Um, so we do have some questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to try and read these. So the first one was a question from Sujit Pal, uh, talking about, I think you mentioned earlier in the talk about three buckets, um, sample queries, evaluations, 
uh, sample queries and evaluations. And uh, Sujit asked, won't there be leakage across these three buckets if they're all sampled independently and separately from the input data? Let me actually reshare the presentation because I understood I did it stupidly. It would be much better if I can talk when I'm looking at the slide. This was quite early on, so let's have a look, see if we can find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even understood what we're talking. I think that is the slide that we're talking about. Yes. And so he's asking, uh, won't there be leakage across these both buckets if they're all sampled independently and separately from the input data? Uh, yes, there might be, and yes, that shouldn't be the case, uh, because as in uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, uh, when you're sampling da like data test training evaluation, of course, you need to um, check that they're not uh, having um, intersecting objects, otherwise your algorithm uh, will uh, overfit or something else, so it should be separated, of course, okay. uh, so separated on the algorithmic level. Yeah, the leakage uh, shouldn't, um, that would be a big mistake. <laughs> okay, so um, Andreas Wagman actually uh, adds here, he thinks that if the buckets are big enough, this shouldn't be a problem. Um, so we've got another question. Um, Andreas himself asks um, a question re regarding sampling. After sampling and for computation of metrics, is any weighting applied? Uh, e.g. if I'm supply sampling 100 very frequent, 100 medium or 100 rare ones, they, they will have a bit of a different effect on overall satisfaction. I'm guessing he's talking about queries there in terms of rare queries. And ah, yeah, but the, exactly the algorithm of the sampling of the stratified sampling is applied weighting. Um, I guess um, I will try to very shortly explain it again. Uh, I guess I, I missed that point. So uh, imagine we are having these buckets. Um, imagine we're taking all over the queries and ordering them by the frequency they're being asked by a user, different users to a system. So the most popular query is like, I don't know, iPhone. And the least, um, I don't know, I, I can't imagine, but there is a query which has uh, like, which been only asked once. And there is a query which been asked like millions of times as an iPhone. So you have this ranked list, ordered list of queries and their frequencies. They're like all over the system. Then you are uh, dissecting all of this list into the buckets in a such manner, and the weights are the frequencies, in a such manner that in each bucket, the sum of frequencies is equal in between buckets. So as you can imagine, the popular bucket will be the smallest one and the, like the bucket of unpopular queries will be the largest one in the means of items in it. And then you're performing sampling from each of the bucket uh, independently. So in the end, uh, you have a representation uh, that you have much more uh, popular queries in general sampled, uh, because you're sampling, uh, sampling independently from each bucket the same amount of queries. So if in popular bucket there are like 10 queries and you're sampling five, and uh, in the not popular bucket there are like 1,000 of queries and you're sampling five, there is kind of um, the same distribution as in production um, of the queries. Uh, so you're capturing it with weighting of the frequencies. And that's so effectively you're sampling more frequent queries than you are sampling rare yes. queries. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Exactly. I hope that answered your question there, Andreas. Um and, and Audrey, you said do you sample from just three buckets or do you sample from all buckets? Um I think there will there was a, a little bit of um not like misunderstanding, but the mixing because there are buckets and baskets. Okay. Buckets. It's about uh, from like you have, for example, one basket for validation or one basket for KPI. So that's ah, uh, okay. Yes, that's okay. a ma major like um, amount of queries that you're going to train your algorithm on or validate or something. But in each basket, you're trying to represent the whole distribution of queries in your search engine. And by that, to do that, you're using algorithm where you're dividing them all into buckets. So oh, I feel yeah. like okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I kind of mixed the minds. Okay, so I think we've we've solved that one, and I think uh, Audrey uh, is on the chat, and I, you, we've managed to to sort that out. So I'm, I'm glad we've uh, we've unconfused you there, Audrey. Okay, so Bennett had a question: Why do you suggest having pairwise judgments instead of pointwise judgments? Uh, because pointwise are good at the beginning, but the problem is, uh, as I tried to mention, that they are like very biased in the means that. Uh, when you are showing the all over of the documents, uh, human firstly, it's a very hard task for a crowdsourcing. Um, uh, secondly, humans are biased because it's very hard for them to understand. Like, let's have an example of pointwise judgment. You have like a, um, a query, you have an um, image. Oh, let's say we're like working with an image searching engine and you're saying like how it's relevant from the scale of one to five and uh, different people perceive uh, differently this scale from one to five for some person uh, he is positive and he always says five and the other person is like more negative and he always says three uh, so point wise judgments they are very good in the means that they are much easier for aggregation but pair wise are much more closer to the nature of the people looking at the results so uh, for humans it's much easier to compare to objects and just by the inner sense of what is suiting more they don't have to you don't have to define for them the term relevance you don't have to deal with the different understanding of different people of the scale of relevancy you're just giving them the task what do you like more so it's usually it uh, ends up in the better results yeah yeah um and i think i think matt has um uh matt actually could chimes in on the same question here um is there any need for the the, the same uh i mean when you're you're judging one relevant what if you do a pairwise judgment you know and one one is better than the other is there any need for a, an answer that's the, they're both the same and how do you cope with that uh usually in the interface of the assignment you don't have the option the same i mean it doesn't mean that you can't introduce it um so i would say it's like um it might be introduced in the interface and then it might be ad addressed somehow in the Bradley Terry model. But uh, from the general sense, I would say that from the common sense, I would say that if they are the same, uh, it doesn't matter to put one uh, higher or lower. So uh, it's enough for... Uh, oh, yeah. So the, out the outputs, I mean, you're still... In that case, if you use that judgment to train your system, yeah. you'll still get a yeah. good result. What about yeah. if both are irrelevant? Uh, yes, uh, that might be the case. Um, and that actually should be addressed in the interface. That's a very interesting point. Um, I would say that um, that might be a very actually that might be a very interesting point and i need to think about it because yeah uh we're assuming that our algorithm works with a some certain accuracy which returns somehow relevant documents like being completely irrelevant uh, i guess then you should address it on the earlier stages when you're not evaluating the accuracy but you're tuning your algorithm uh to make some sensible defaults some sensible results yeah, but and yeah, I guess I still... the, for, the, for the rare queries that, you know, for the, the tail queries, which are generally not handled so well for an end by an engine. That's yeah, that might be likely. a case. I would say that would be a nice way to handle it in the interface, give the option of the being both relevant and uh, then uh, uh, specifically uh, filter them out and uh, reevaluate, rejudge your system, rebase them on that queries. That might be a very nice signal, actually. Okay. Okay, hope that answers your question there, Matt. So do we have any other questions uh, for Eugenia? Ah, oh, another one from Bennett. Uh, how do you decide to how many buckets to choose for your stratified sampling? Oh, that's a very nice question because I really uh, faced it recently in the production. So usually there is no uh, a golden, uh, that like there is no like five or 10. There is no golden constant to that. Usually you look at the bucket of the most popular queries and you're trying to see how well it's um, represented. 
uh, because as you understand, like since when you are selecting uh, some certain um, uh, sum, sum that you want to each bucket to have, uh, by defining the first bucket, you're defining the others. So I am usually looking at the most popular bucket and I am looking if it fits all of the queries that are for this domain are the most important, uh, the most frequently asked, let's say for like, uh, um, if we're dealing with e-com and uh, for example, it's like some uh, website, uh, Amazon, let's say. Yeah, I want to see that in the most popular queries bucket, there are like iPhones, uh, the, the, the uh, items which I want to definitely uh, be considered as popular and be high quality. And then the rest is just defined by the first bucket. So it's more like of um, adjusting the hyperparameter, looking at the most popular bucket and seeing that everything that concerns me is fitting there. Okay, fantastic. Right, let's uh, see if we have any more questions. Oops, uh, let me just find my chat window. Um, I think that's about it actually. Uh, unless anyone has a last minute question, do just type it into the uh, the chat here. Do we have any more questions? Your last chance. Wonderful. Well, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Evgenia uh, 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 yeah, that's a not a terrible attempt at the name. Uh, I, I like Charlie topic. how you try to approach it at the end, but not in the beginning. <laughs> you you were preparing for my talk. <laughs> it took me the whole talk to work out how to pronounce it. This is this was a, a, a testament to my terrible British language skills. Anyway, thank you so much. That was uh, fascinating, and I think people got a lot out of it. And we have, we have some some uh, thank yous coming up in the chat window there. So um, I'm just going to uh, finish up with a, a couple of. Um, uh, announcements. So we've got uh, the next meetup, the next Haystack Live meetup. Well, we don't have one planned currently. And the main reason for that is nobody's volunteered to speak. We've had a couple of people actually submit and they haven't got back to me. But if you can talk about something relevant to this, this lovely crowd of people on search and relevance, then please do volunteer. You can find the submission form on the Haystack website. Um, uh, we'd love to have a, a set of talks we could plan over the next few months. But in the meantime, of course, you could go to Poland on the 23rd of February. Join us in Krakow for a haystack on tour uh, with speakers. Uh, we're going to be talking about everything from e-commerce search to voice powered search to vector search. And that's going to be lots of fun. And thanks to our colleagues at eDrone who are supporting that event. And I've also got um, an announcement for you. It looks like Haystack US, yes, the big one, is going to be the week of the 24th of April in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, we don't have confirmation of everything yet, um, but that is the most likely week. So if you're looking for weeks to block out in your calendar, do take a look. We're hoping to announce the call for papers very soon, um, hopefully over the next week. So we're looking for your presentations as well. And also for Haystack US this year, we're going to plan lots of things. We're going to have two days of conference. We're hoping to have some meetups, hopefully some maybe some training, some chance to, to, to work together, co-working space, and even some fun social events. Uh, after the event as well. Really hope you make your week in Charlottesville a great one. So keep an eye on all the usual channels for that. Um, and check out, um, of course, our map of search meetups worldwide. Join Relevant Slack. If you're not in Relevant Slack, it's where all the cool search relevance folks hang out. Um, join it there. And also, if you're interested in any of the talks from our Haystack Live or any of our other conferences, check out our YouTube channel. There's over 100 videos there from people, lots of different experts talking about search and relevance. So do take a look um, and hopefully that'll be a great way to, to raise your level of knowledge. So thank you again, uh, Evgenia, and we will um, see you all back here again soon at Haystack Live. My name's Charlie Hull. I'm from Open Source Connections, where the search and relevance people. Thank you very much and see you all soon. Thank you very much.